Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, it's been a long time coming, but finally managed to uh, get Mark Upton on the podcast. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Stu. Pleasure to be here. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for the invitation. The, the irony of this is um, we were crossing paths pretty regularly um, through our day jobs, walking past each other in corridors or seeing each other, having meetings with each other. And you were living around about, about 40 minutes away from where I was living. And it took you to move yeah. to the other side of the world for us to finally yeah. connect on the podcast. <laughs> exactly, mate. There's some sort of irony in that, isn't there? I think we just wanted to really test out the idea of online technology, didn't we, and really utilise it. <laughs> so um yeah i mean it might actually be worth uh, i know you'll probably be well known to most listeners of this podcast but as the audience is growing not everybody will necessarily have uh, have come across you i wonder if we could start off by maybe just sort of giving us the whole backstory and you know uh, how you have arrived sort of kind of where you are now and all the various bits and pieces in between yeah, sure, mate. Um, I'm sure we can fill in some of the gaps as we go along too, rather than boring people too much up front. Um, yeah, so if you haven't guessed by now, it's an Australian accent, not not a New Zealand accent, which is actually what people were guessing, Stu, when I did come over to England four years ago, first lob, there were quite a few accusations of being a Kiwi, which um, cool. I had to take away. So, it, yeah, it, yeah, I'm Australian, mate, and... Um, living well, back in Adelaide now, um, which is uh, where I was from originally, so from Adelaide in South Australia. Um, professionally, how did I get started, I guess? Um, started out yeah, at university, I studied a human movement degree, so did a bit of, did a bit of, sorry, backpedal a little bit, did a bit of um, junior tennis coaching and Aussie rules coaching, like uh, kids. Um, kind of in my late teens uh then yeah got into I had a few failed attempts actually starting uni and then eventually settled on human movement as kind of something that uh, engaged me and um which I guess was for science um but actually the the element I really enjoyed in the human movement degree was the coaching element um so there was a, a general coaching principles like a level two kind of um embedded into that which I, which I really enjoyed um, and got some practical coaching through that. Unfortunately, some of that's dropped out now of the more recent kind of human movement sports science degrees, um, which I think they're poorer for. So anyway, I did that and then uh, was fortunate to get an opportunity with one of the professional uh, AFL Aussie rules clubs here in Adelaide. Um, yeah, and started out as that typical kind of just – uh, fitness assistant there was no such thing as the high performance department back then um, or performance directors or anything like that so uh, yeah it was your classic pretty much fitness assistant putting out cones helping out where you, where I can but it was a really good experience um, you know I learned a lot from a lot of quality people you probably didn't recognize at the time actually how much learning and wisdom I was kind of being exposed to that was I guess seeping in almost tacitly so it's one of those things to reflect back on um so I end up spending about 12 years or so at um at that club through a variety of roles and actually it, it fairly quickly moved on to more of the the coaching side if you like which was what I kind of had an inkling I kind of preferred so a bit of um kind of performance analysis stuff and then skill acquisition um and and kind of coaching our game style style of play you know practice design all those types of things and then a little bit of coach development work at the end, kind of working to develop some of the other assistant coaches there. Um, then finished up there. Uh, yeah, and kind of had a feeling I wanted to 
get out of that bubble where it was only a national sport, obviously. So I, I kind of had a feeling I really wanted to get out of the bubble. I didn't necessarily intend to lob in England, <laughs> Stu. That wasn't our initial plan. It was probably to stay in Oz, but end up coming over to, to the UK in 2013, um, a role in kind of coach development type role with the English Institute of Sport, which was a new role for them to have. Um, yeah, so came across with the family, lived, uh, yeah, not far from, from where you are, mate, kind of 60 miles west of London, a little place called Marlow. Um, so I've spent about four years there um, and a couple of years into that role as well, um, also um, kind of branched out, I guess, and partnered up with a guy called Al Smith, who some listeners may be aware of, who was, all, was at the AIS. And we've started to do some some things under the My Faster Smile um, brand, if you like, um, which is really working probably at different levels of sports clubs, organisation systems um, to try and help people have a really meaningful, purposeful experience in sport, whether that's kids, volunteers, parents, um, you know, through to to those who aspire to be the best in the world at what they do. Um, so I've had a bit of fun doing some some projects there. There's some stuff going on in Stockholm as we speak this week around some of that. Um, but I'm back in Adelaide, mate. So I've been back in Adelaide for the last month or so. Um, yeah, doing a range of things, helping out a couple of national governing bodies here, doing a little bit of stuff again with, with an AFL club in Melbourne. Um, yeah, and actually finding some, some free time to spend with my little bloke who's nine, which is... Um, there's plenty of learning there, observing his uh, soccer and basketball and other sporting activity and environments that he's in. I'm sure there's plenty to discuss there, Stu. So I'll leave it at that, mate, for the moment. It, it's fascinating, actually, that um, there's a couple of things in what you've just said there that I think can be interesting to just explore more. Firstly, <clears throat> I didn't realise how similar our kind of life trajectories have been. Um, you know, yeah. I, did, I did human movement as well, funnily enough. I stumbled into human movement uh, having basically the i wanted to be a graphic designer because you know that's like a proper job and working in working <laughs> yeah. in sport is you know it's just sort of a bit of a hobby really. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. this was prior to you know really there being any kind of serious career path in the sports landscape you know it was um and so i wanted to be a graphic designer and then the art teacher caught me on the hockey pitch for the 16th time when i was supposed to be in his class and he said to me i think you should have a career in sport and there's a calling yeah, proved to be uh, great advice. So I'm very, yeah. uh, I'm very. If Mr. Morgan happens to be listening to this podcast, I'm very, uh, I'm very indebted to him for that advice. Um, but um, yeah. but interestingly, yeah. So there's human movement, and interestingly, um, pedagogy was probably my favourite bit of it, and it definitely yeah. started me on the coaching journey. Uh, yeah. Kind of ignited a, a curiosity around people yeah. development and human development. Yeah. Um, and then obviously similar similar career paths, but it's yeah. So just just interesting. I'd be interested to explore that a bit. What, what was it about that that kind of got you know piqued your interest and then took you off in this sort of direction? Uh, about which, which bit in particular, Stuart? The sort of ped- the pedagogical element of human movement that you got. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I, I think it was. See, the interesting thing, human movement didn't cover. Um, too much of what we'd probably put under the skill acquisition banner now, which mm. you know, I guess there's arguments pedagogy does overlap with that, although then they, they are different and distinct as well. So it wasn't a huge amount of skill act stuff in there, but there was, there was a little there was a little bit of that, and I remember that being quite interesting in the amount of the motor learning stuff and even some really basic stuff then around around gait. And I remember some uh, uh, there was a um might have been a lab test on a treadmill and it was actually it was basically dynamical systems but at that stage I had no idea like I could make no real practical connection I think this is another really interesting thing about when you should do your theory and be exposed to some of these more academic ideas should it come first I when you do a uni degree then go into practice or should it come later on because I remember they did this treadmill test showing that as change of speed and this idea of a phase transition from a walking to a, to a jogging or a running or a striding, so this change in gait based on the speed of the treadmill, which is pretty basic stuff, but there's really interesting theory behind it. But if you haven't kind of gone and explored the world and explored sports environments and trying to help athletes, players, teams get better, it's kind of, eh, it's interesting, but 
yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then everything kind of loops back around again. So there, there was different elements of that. The, yeah, the coaching, I, I don't know why, why specifically that coaching element has interested me. I guess, I've, yeah, I've just always been, even, I think even, even growing up, you know, I, I played sport, but I was always more interested in kind of understanding sport. Like I was always being a real observer of team sports in particular and what makes good teams or good players good and, and those sorts of things. So I think there was just that curiosity for some reason, probably from a relatively early age, um, just kind of then led me down that path. And then in AFL, we had a guy called Damien Farrow, who again, a number of people would be familiar with, um, probably one of the first to really bring skill acquisition um, to the fore and certainly in professional team sports. So he consulted with us in the AFL for, for quite a few years. Um, yeah, so that, that was probably a rich learning experience for me to be exposed to, I guess, the theory, but in a practical context. Um, and, and that probably tri- triggered, you know, then thinking, yeah, this is a really interesting area. Um, that you know, I've, I guess, ex- continued to explore the theory side of it, whilst m- more so, obviously, being a, a practitioner in, in different capacities. So, um, in in terms of that, then you one of the other other things that you mentioned, which I think is quite interesting, and I think might be also illustrative of your, uh, you know, you mentioned there, you know, you were interested in understanding kind of sport, understanding it and observing it mm-hmm. and kind of. So then obviously uh, that then naturally played a role within sort of like the performance analysis space. So interestingly, because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm kind of wondering how you from a performance analytics type of context have kind of then how that then morphed into, you know, the, the, the kind of ecological sort of thinking and mm-hmm. all those sorts of things. Because mm-hmm. the reason I asked this question is, I mean, I, I would say you were probably one of the first people who, I ever well I think you're responsible for me discovering uh Newell's constraints model yeah because you were on um the internet you know out there putting out um you know stuff you know one of the pioneers of kind of getting info out there and we we actually connected over that didn't we because I was sort of blogging loosely if you can call it that um so I'm interested how did the kind of analytics stuff and then the constraints stuff and the ecological stuff start to sort of find themselves weaving together um, I think probably the key thing that brings it together is the idea of representative training design, learning design. So through the performance analysis, it was all, it was more, it wasn't the, the data or analytics as it's probably known now so much. It was, it was really saying, you know, is, is our training and practice design resembling the game? Um, and, and, you know, if we look closely at the game and the demands of the game, you know, are we, are we creating those? Are, are they represented in, in our training in some way? Which doesn't mean we have to play the full game all the time, but, you know, elements of, of that, um, how representative are they? So I think that was probably the connection and where maybe some of the analysis work we did was really trying to trying to inform that. So that was, you know, between Damien and I, I guess that was the angle we took is a lot of our analysis informed our practice design. It wasn't about KPIs or, you know, trying to come up with best practice models of a, of a style of play or predict things necessarily. Um, I think it more informed our practice design, which I think, again, you know, these are the things looking back, at the time, I think probably for a couple of years, held us in pretty good stead. We, you know, we were a pretty decent team for two or three years, and I think that we we got a got an advantage, not an advantage as such, but we were probably just doing it a bit differently. Um, so that was, I, I imagine, then then. So your role as a performance analyst, I suppose, doing for being focused on kind of practice design and finding ways from, as I guess, ob- observation of of matches to then translate what is happening in games to then translate that into a practice context. So it's got a meaning associated mm-hmm. with the activity and mm-hmm. that would have been Damien's influence over that, wouldn't it? Cause I think traditionally, and, and I mean, early stages of analytics, I imagine, but 
traditionally what it would be there'd be a series of numbers created or whatever it is you know number of passes completed or whatever it is or number of fumbles or whatever it might be and then that information would then lead a coach towards a particular course of action but it wouldn't necessarily be getting underneath the why of some of those actions so your role I suppose was to take some of those actions and then to help design practice for then the coaching staff to to work with yeah yeah Absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, it was probably a fit again, I think I alluded to a few minutes ago about probably not being aware that I was exposed to working with some pretty high quality coaches and other people is mm. that integrated way of working. So this is obviously a massive um, issues framing it the wrong way, but a key dynamic, particularly in high performance sport around coaches and sports scientists and that off field team is those dynamics yeah. And actually, they were working really well in a really integrated way um, in in the environment I was in for a number of years. So, um, yeah, that kind of enabled, you know, things to come together and, and to be useful. Whereas even today, you know, a lot of actually probably good analysis work just, you know, doesn't end up in the bin but doesn't really get utilised um, because it's, you know, it doesn't probably start from the right point and therefore kind of just fizz, fizzles out uh, a lot of the time, which comes back to to uh, team and group dynamics and, you know, all those things around your culture and your broader environment, which is probably, you know, where I've gone to in more recent years with, with some of the, the work um, that I've been doing. And and, that, and so actually I'd be interested to just sort of drill into that really a little bit more around your approach Um around you know the 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 sort of philosophical underpinnings if you like of the way you approach organizational development um Mm -hmm. you know or you know what you know group group dynamics or whatever it is and you're doing it on a kind of organizational scale big organization down to a kind of team scale but the principles are still pretty much the same aren't they yeah, you've summed it up nicely, Stu. I think we can move on. <laughs> no, oh, no exactly. because you now need to share the principles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, okay. No, no, there's principles. No, there's, there's principles. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, continue to maybe draw those connections. I think the, the interesting one, same kind of with this idea of representative design, was starting to think about that in coach development contexts. Mm-hmm. So I was, you know, I was, we were obviously talking about it from developing the, the skills that players need to, you know, adapt to their environment and, you know, they have to make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. I started to think about that in coach development as well. And, you know, a lot of the literature will say coaching is a complex activity. You, coaches are constantly making decisions whether they're aware of them or not, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, like how do we best develop coaches? Well, again, is it in a you know, completely non-representative way, like we put them all in a classroom and we just pour information into their heads and call that coach development, or do we look at some some other ways of doing it? And again, should we be trying to create more representative situations? So um, that's been one aspect, and I think that then goes broader for not just developing coaches, but a, a whole range of roles, um, people, and particularly in leadership positions who are, you know, dealing in working in complex environments and, you know, having to make decisions and, you know, often work together as, as a team, you know, that, that those principles then of, I guess, what the demands are as well as how do we best develop people um, to, to work in those environments are quite similar. That's where it scales, like you're saying, from on the field to, to off the field as well. Um, so, uh one of the things I was just going to say there is that I'd be interested just to sort of unpack that a little bit more, um, bring that to life. Cause I was having a discussion recently with some, um, it's actually a group of fairly, well, very well respected academics and we're having a exchange of views, shall we say? Um, and one of the things they were talking about was, um, we were talking about like knowledge. So your point, your point about, you know, kind of pouring mm. knowledge into the top of the head and it turning into, Mm. into some sort of behavior or whatever it is or some sort of change of behavior and for me I feel like um and we were talking about it in the context of uh you know almost like a master's level uh uh coaching program you know what you might Mm. call a level four which is mapped against uh you know kind of a, a a postgraduate degree and the discussion we were having was their sense, their feeling was you have to have the knowledge in order to be able then to make some of the connections. 
But like you said, right back at the start of this, you know, if you haven't got a contextual mean, my argument was, if you haven't got a contextual meaning, as in mm. a problem that you haven't been able to solve, and you then mm. go and, so then you go, right, well, let me try and work out how to solve this problem, right? What is it that, that in the sort of in the research, in the theory that is going to help me solve this problem? They would say, no, 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 you have to have a foundation of knowledge. Otherwise, you never make the connections with things. Mm. And it was a bit of a back and forward. And I think prob the, probably the reality is somewhere in the middle. But mm. I do think there is this educational paradigm, if you like, that is pretty wedded to the idea of knowledge is important. You must have this sort of declarative knowledge, if you like. And then the procedural knowledge comes later on. And in my mm. mind, I'm sort of thinking it's either going to work both ways or, in my opinion, I think it's more powerful when something happens in the context and then that sparks a desire to learn mm. yeah yeah i think yeah i think you're right it's the both and again it's one of those ones isn't it you can get caught in that false dichotomy and yeah you know, i guess i think actually what it truly is true is maybe um the um the program i know you're aware of we've been running with with uh, rick shuttleworth of and what we're trying to do is it, i guess keep we're talking about keeping things coupled is keeping those things more coupled as in um, learning to act, acting to learn. So, yeah, we appreciate there's need for, you know, knowledge sharing, dialogue, discussion, conversation, you know, things that are very explicit, if you want to call it like that. But then we also appreciate if it's a loop between actually applying those things. But if it's a loop, it doesn't have to start with the knowledge. It could start in the more practical context or application and then you come to So you act in some way mm. and then it's like, yeah, then the problem, but, hmm, that didn't seem to work. Mm. Why is that? And that might then, you know, be the opportunity where, ah, okay, now there's, you know, something to learn around a bit of knowledge, what, whatever that is, you know, it could be in any area. Um, so I, I think it's definitely a, a both and, but I don't think necessarily it always has to kind of be that knowledge or theory into practice. Mm. I think it can work and is working probably constantly, mm. you know, um, in more of a loop type fashion, which, you know, where does that loop start? Well, there is no start and finish in a loop, really. That's mm. why it's a loop. <laughs> and I know that you and Rick are very passionate about this as well in terms of let's just ca carrying on along the theme of coach development, which is to to make the learning <clears throat> very situated in the sense that uh, it's often about exploring so either two things exploring a challenge that the coach has identified for themselves within the activity that they're doing or yeah. making the coach aware of something that they may not have previously been aware of kind of live mm. and in the moment almost mm tagging it with them mentally and then using that as a reference point to have a conversation with them about afterwards otherwise they yeah. may not have noticed it in the first place yeah yeah absolutely so i mean you talk about and again this similar principle with players or coaches i think about the learning comes when you destabilize really if you want to talk about stability instability in some of those terms so sometimes as you said probably to start with in the first example, a coach is already destabilised if he's already he or she's already bringing a problem, mm -hmm. as in something hasn't worked or there's something going on that just they haven't been able to figure out and it's causing them some angst or you know their things are going around. How how do I approach this? In a way, they're already destabilised, so the support then can come. You know, we're actually trying to help them to find a way through it, to navigate through it, and to basically to find some st a level of stability again or coherence around whatever it is. But in in other cases, and probably a lot of times with with uh, in coaching, probably coaches are a bit too stable, as in they're a bit too sure that no, no, what I'm doing, that's that's fine, that's perfect, it's best practice. There's no you know no discussion to enter into. So actually. The first challenge there is how do you destabilise people? How do you perturb them a little bit? And it can just be through a, you know, a question just and kind of just that you just leave lingering or hanging and often you won't get a response straight away and you're not sure whether it's hit the mark. But quite regularly, it's amazing actually how often that coaches will go away and they've obviously been thinking about it because they'll come back in a week or two weeks or a month and go, you know how you asked about that? I've been thinking about that and mm, maybe there is something in it. And it's not say we have the answer or I have the answer. You know, it's probably what I you know, try to steer away from as much as, much as possible because I, I think often actually coaches do have the answers or the solutions. They're just not 
or the people who are working in the context have them. They just need some help in how to, how to get there. So it's just, you know, it's another way of looking at challenge and support, if you like, but sometimes coaches already destabilised. How do we support them to find some stability in a way forward? Other times we need to actually perturb them um, and destabilise them because that, that's where the learning and the growth is. And how do you find, and I suppose it's, there's, there's no easy answer to this because I suppose it's a, it, the, the answer is it's probably through experience, but in your experience, how do you find the balance point between mm. overly destabilizing mm. to the point of either you get the response you either get is a rejection response yeah. or, or a, the, there's so much uncertainty now that the individual is like, well, what the hell am I here doing? What am, what, yeah. who am I all about all of a sudden yeah. is versus, versus sort of not state, not destabilizing enough. And then, you know, almost you're a little bit like a fly that you just need to be swatted away. You know, mm. change, obviously human change is hard, isn't it? And people mm. aren't always super receptive, even though they overtly say they are. So yeah. in your experience, and I'd just be interested in, I mean, you obviously don't, you don't have to mention any names, but, I'm interested just to sort of some of your experiences and your stories of when, for for example, you may have got that wrong or you may have mm. got that right. Mm. Mm. Well, def- and I think one of the one of the factors I think involved is when when do, is the right time if you re- if you really want to want to push and and like I say it, the coach may say they're up for it, but I think there's there's a, there's a there's a period of time of you know first seek to understand. So as a not just a coach developer, but trying to do any sort of human development and systems development is first understand the person you're working with or the system. So you need to try, I think, first just get a really good handle on that because that will then kind of guide is in how quickly and how much do we challenge or perturb. Is it the right time? Like at the moment, um, we're in the middle of a AFL season, so some of the work I'm doing there, it's, at the moment it's not the right time to really... <laughs> to to really stick the the needle in in some spots and and see what reaction we get because it's just yeah it's just not the right time but come the end of a season um, where people have a bit more time and space that that's where I think some of say the current assumptions and beliefs need to be challenged a bit harder and and you know and finding a, a, a variety of exercises um, and ways to do that um, so that that's certainly my first. Um, port of call I think is first just to understand the person and the context they're working in um, and then kind of make your move from there if you like but again but always looking to really understand you know what are they up for and and what are they interested in and what are they going to engage in because I think if you if you find that just that that's the other starting point too I think is is you know what just what are the, where's their interests what are they going to engage in because if you get them engaged then I think you can kind of they stay on the journey and you can help keep them on the journey even when it gets more challenging okay. so yeah it's just looking for those roots in initially if we're talking just about trying to develop people in general mm. yeah the tension comes is and this probably gets interesting Stu in when you know the role you type kind of play in a system when a system and I talk system now is in a formal organisation wants to see results quicker or certain things delivered by x date and have x impact that needs to be measured that's when some real tensions and i think probably the biggest tensions at the moment um come about because you then tend to force coerce and do some other things that you know i think ultimately actually limit um the positive impact that you could have yeah Oh, blimey, there's so much we could talk about. <laughs> um, just before we do, uh, we jump off on that end point where you just dangled that beautiful, you destabled, beautiful little dangle of a carrot. You just created a nice little affordance for me to go down. I'm going to go down it, trust me, but I want to okay. come back. Um, yeah. um, so I, was just, I was just fishing a bit there with you, Stu. Yeah, I can see. What you're up for. I can see. It's, 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 <laughs> it's like it's... Like it's it's like it's a very very skillful, yeah. But I've I've seen your little ploy, Mark, and I'm not yeah. trapped, not falling for the trap yet. But I will, um, <laughs> um, which is um, I I was interested in you you believe uh, I know you believe in you believe in learning you believe in uh, you believe in the power of story as a means mm-hmm. as a means of human learning. Um, mm-hmm. 
you believe in you also believe in uh you know learning through experience which includes learning from and reflecting from when we've been successful when we've been unsuccessful taking ideas from, from those sorts of things so i'm interested in over your time when you've got that wrong and yeah. your sort of reflections of that it's like we almost they've actually planned this in advance Stu, but we haven't but it's a really good segue actually to an interesting story about stories and oh, okay. and when i guess i was more in what we might term the performer phase um which i think was about in 05 or 06 i was a few i've been working in the afl for a few years but i was still only in my mid-20s um and i remember we we had uh, these couple of people come in from an organisation to talk to us as a coaching group about storytelling and the power of storytelling. Mm. And, again, it obviously connected with me at some level because I can still remember it from 12 years ago, thinking, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. But I was still in that phase of, yeah, yeah, but let, let's talk about the game style and the X and O's and the technical aspects of coaching because I, I didn't have enough life experience, to be honest, then to make that connection of how, how impactful storytelling could be for, you know, again, both and for performance as well as just to allow, you know, a really positive environment where people could grow and develop and, and flourish potentially and, and form that real connection. So, yeah, from 12 years ago, kind of going, yeah, that's interesting, but now let's bring out the what, you know, the tactics board again to probably, you know, maybe five or six years ago, yeah, revisit revisiting it if you like but mainly mainly again through reading and just through being then in a different stage in my life I think from that then being a parent from you know having kind of stepped out of an AFL environment started to see the bigger picture from you know having a few different personal challenges as well so just different time in my life it did, you know it started to connect much more I think um, and, and start to make a lot more sense to the to the point yeah we've we've kind of used that I guess narrative storytelling type approach to as one what I was saying earlier to understand yeah to really understand a person or a system or a context you're in but equally yeah to create that connection you know to, um, between people as well and, and build those sorts of things and and um, this is where I'm becoming more skillful as a podcast host after 50 odd episodes. Um, so I mean, have any to, more episodes till you're expert? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I ever will be. I'll always be on a learning trajectory, but um, oh, there's probably some nine, sort of 9,950, isn't it? Oh, that's right. Yes, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on how many hours the podcast lasts for. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple, isn't it? Um, yeah. uh, uh oh god you've done it again oh no you've done it again you dangled another little carrot for me to go down um anyway um just but uh, of interest um i i am still going to come back which is when have you tell me about a time when you got that kind of challenge point wrong or oh. it wasn't what you expected you you didn't get the you know kind of you you went in there and you kind of had an intervention with an individual of any kind mm. from any context mm. Mm. and you kind of got what you might what we might call unexpected results or it it kind of backfired a little bit or whatever you know because rick talks about uh you got to cut someone i think he got it from eddie didn't he you got to cut mm. somebody a little bit to bring about change um, yeah. eddie jones and um my, my, I have been on the receive. The reason I'm asking this question is, um, I have been on the receiving end of having my arm chopped off, the equivalent mm -hmm. of you know where mm -hmm. I went through a significant destabilization to the point of what am I even doing in this space? Yeah, yeah. I, I climbed back out of it. I was definitely in the you know the kind of abyss of the, the learning zone. You know, I was in the pit. Yeah, uh, the and pit, I climbed yeah. back out of it, and it definitely had a very important and transformational effect on me, but. Mm -hmm. I would never affect that on someone else because I mm. felt like it was too destabilizing. Mm. I was fortunate. I had people around me and a framework around me that was able to help me make sense of it. But yeah. the intervention itself was just far too, um, far too invasive. If you like it kind of okay. it, it got to, and I'm wondering whether you've had any similar experiences or have you just been like on this beautiful trajectory of no, <laughs> no, no, no. I think I think what I've um, fall like fallen for, Stu, is probably a bit actually not really challenging enough in a in a way. 
okay. like probably early on falling for people kind of kind of nodding and and not actually yeah and <laughs> not really probably testing and challenging not challenging is not the right word no it, it it wasn't creating the space early on for divergent or uh, conflicting views so it was kind of falling for the you know i I'm, i've been brought in here supposedly i have you know some of the answers and then kind of seeing people generally agreeing and thinking yeah okay so we're going to see a change or things are going to be a lot better and of course in some of those you have follow-ups you know continually you know a few months at a time and of course you're not seeing any change and over time you realize that yeah you're not that's not really the way to go about it. So I think what I what I learned from that those situations is my my aim is to try to create a space where we can have really good dialogue and dissenting voices. Um, and and what I've learned coming in there, see, so you have this problem because often when you're brought in, particularly to work in a group of coaches or in that workshop type setting, is you're the supposed expert. Mm. So the first thing, you know, I try to lay out is I don't have the answers. Science definitely doesn't have the answers. You've probably collectively got some of the answers that you need. You maybe don't know it yet. And actually the more diversity of views and opinions that we can have, but in a really healthy way, you know, the richer the learning's going to be. So just, yeah, learning to, I guess, to facilitate that uh, better has probably, you know, been my kind of, learning trajectory if you like um i remember i remember going to one of the early relearns uh where you and al and i think it was andrew gillett at the time um andrew if you're listening um you you need to be on this podcast i keep telling him but he keeps avoiding me at the scarlet pimpernel anyway um uh i went to one of the early relearns and i remember um how I could literally see you guys live sort of struggling with that because you wanted to keep it where like, yeah, you've come along and a lot of people have come along because obviously, you know, you, Alan and and Andrew are all very knowledgeable in this space and we want to learn. And a lot of people equate learning with coming and listening to others basically provide their knowledge. And you didn't do that. You basically kept it very, open the dialogue's very open you even had a microphone ball that people could talk into um and passing it around but you kept the discussion amongst the group and i, I know quite a few people uh, not well at least two or three people on the, at the time sort of i think were a bit like no this isn't what i expected I, mm. I i didn't come here to kind of listen from other people who were kind of the same as me i came mm. here to listen to the experts and it's quite interesting isn't it how <clears throat> people's perception of what learning is based mm. on the only experiences they've ever had of learning, i.e. a knowledgeable expert in the front telling mm. them things. Quite interesting to sort of, to, you almost have to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You have to orientate people to this different learning methodology, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it comes back to, you know, understanding why that is. Well, I'm, part of that needs to be, what's the history of this thing, you know, where's this come from? So where's that expectation that this is what it will look and feel like? Where's that come from? Well, I know you've probably talked up, you've probably touched on a bit in the past episodes, Stu, around education systems. You know, that's what we, most of us will come through quite a specific looking, feeling and style of a, of a classroom or a school from, you know, early in our lives. And, and that, that probably, that shapes, what we think learning is and, and we probably equate it in a one-to-one type mapping, don't we? You know, that classroom equals learning, learning equals classroom and yeah. that's that's all there is um, and, it, and it can take a while. So, yeah, again, that's, you know, probably got used to um, to people who will come with those expectations and some really do then struggle. So sometimes you still have to throw in some things to stimulate the conversation. You know, what do you think about this? So you know, which you can share. So start to share some of your own experiences. Um, but again, it's not necessarily, again, to people scribble down an answer from it. It's just to stimulate the discussion and to get people thinking. Um, so um, 
when when you've had that scenario where you're creating i think i think have you subsequently going back to the point you made about almost not challenging enough have you mm. did you find over that period because i sort of think i noticed this around you sort of found a balance point between the creation of a of a of a, a conversational stimulus based on an idea a concept mm. some new knowledge that mm. you use then as a reference point for the conversation and then that flowing back in then to a new concept a new idea so you, again you get in that flow of mm. you, may, you know kind of knowledge discussion procedural or procedural conversation i seem to feel like that's the sort of direction you moved in to to then try and find the right challenge point if that makes sense yeah i think so Uh, and again uh, and probably our reflection on some of those relearns Stu, and and i think we might have had them with you as well i guess we always question again when we you know people leave cooper's give a little plug for cooper's (laughs) very good coffee (laughs) Very good coffee. Very good coffee. Um, you know, what, what changes again? And I think, you know, there was certainly that awareness that, you know, lots of, you know, you then can fall into the trap of, again, lots of rich dialogue and discussion. And actually at times people getting quite enthusiastic. Mm. Again, though, then they're back in their context. You know, the reality is there's some certain rate limiters or blockers that exist that maybe they're not enabled yet to deal with or they're not in a position in a hierarchy or whatever it might be to to shift some of those things so that was some of our reflections out of it and probably why we started to again I'll kind of throw a little bit out there why some of our work I guess has started to maybe move away from directly working with coaches on the grass to say what are some of the rate limiters at the club level, the organisational level, the way the board's doing its thing, you know, so to work out to different layers of the system and, and look at some of those things so that we can enable, you know, some of the, these really good coaches and particularly, interestingly, I think not necessarily younger coaches, but there's some, some, some brilliant coaches who are, you know, volunteers or, you know, just get paid small amounts of far from full-time professional, but yeah, have got some, a lot to offer, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um... So on that subject around coming, so circling back to the kind of organizational system stuff, um, what sort of things are you seeing um, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of how the system, so I spent quite a bit of time, as you mentioned earlier, talking to um, James Vaughan a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about kind of socio-cultural, um, yeah. almost politico-cultural um, yeah. influences on the way kind of countries kind of engage with certain forms of human development fascinating conversation uh, but at an organizational level um you know where you know you might essentially have yeah, you have that in microcosm mm. you know, with, with their kind of if you like cultural political and there's a lot of companies out there i think are trying to bring about what they term to be cultural change and you mm-hmm. hear it in sport language like, like the landscape a lot culture mm culture you know precise performance all these sorts of you know buzz phrases but when you actually get into the nitty gritty of that it comes down to kind of how people act and how and mm. what people believe in so what is it mm. that you guys have sort of found that you know kind of taking it from that organizational thing and then how that impacts on the way coaches for example or anybody else are able to mm. act or able to mm. perform yeah, I listen, actually, I, I listened to um, the podcast you did with James and you made, well, James, I thought, did a really good job, didn't he, of describing some of those social, social and cultural constraints, if you want to call it, that are acting at that level at a different time scale, really, aren't they? Then, mm. you know, it's just not in a, in a single coaching session. It's kind of that invisible dark matter that's floating around it. You can't, it's very intangible that's influencing it, but you know, you can't really see and get a grasp of it. And I think, and you made the good point too in that, Stu, that, you know, that that's an example where, you know, constraints framework is not just about practice design. And you said maybe some government, you know, even NGBs are getting a little bit too caught up in it's, we'll just get the practice design right and that'll kind of take care of itself rather than what are all the other dynamics that are kind of flowing around, you know, from, as as you guys said, an industrial past and a, you know, uh, very much a you know capitalism obviously not being dominant but seemingly the only you know economic system that can exist and that continuing to probably infiltrate into sport particularly in professional sport but 
any sport now, isn't it, where money is involved? So obviously public funding wise, you know, that that comes in and so there's certain expectations around, you know, and any funding that is provided and, you know, we have to we have to plan and measure and KPI and do all those very what you might call mechanistic and kind of linear approaches that, you know, ultimately they they probably if you want to talk culture, that's and arguably the people that want to shift to a different culture or some new ways of interacting and behaving, a lot of the time it's those things that are incentivizing certain behaviours that people actually don't want. But they've brought this paradigm, again, that they're not aware that they're operating off it because they often think, well, that's the way it's got to be. If I'm a CEO or, you know, a head of whatever or a leader and they go and do their MBA, which, again... <laughs> says this is the way the world is, society is economy, you know, sport is economy, which is just, you know, doesn't get challenged, then, you know, we kind of get what we get. So we get a lot of these flow-on effects. And I think that's the interesting space to be in at the moment. Well, the interesting space we're starting to work in at the moment. And it, and again, it's, it's the same approach. It's really just trying to create a space for dialogue to say, well, is that the only way? Are there alternatives, ways of leading, managing, organising? particularly when it comes to sport, which we appreciate that that an economy can be part of sport and a sporting system and and will be, but sport's about a hell of a lot more and and I think more important stuff, meaning has much greater meaning and purpose than that. Again, whether it's, you know, kids running around the local park, over 60s playing a game of hockey, you know, the, the, the Warriors and the Rockets squaring off in Western Conference playoff finals at the moment. It, it, you know, there's so much meaning and value that can come from sport, but it's on a really, if it hasn't already tipped over the edge, it's in a really precarious place, I think. So uh, I, I think I, probably the reason that I'm talking about this so much is because I think I, I well, I'm, 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 almost, I'm certain I agree with you. I, and I do feel like, a, a, lot, a lot of the reasons people are talking about this is because I think they're feeling it in all in all quarters. So <clears throat> obviously we can talk about, you know, kind of like socio-political conversations, you know, and, and I'm a kind of philosoph- philosopher and sociologist by trade. So of course I love all that stuff. But, you know, a lot of people who listen to podcasts are people at the grassroots, at the coalface. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, what does that mean for me? Well, actually, in reality, mm-hmm. it means a lot because mm-hmm. I feel like the sports experience has become infected by this. So... Mm-hmm. There's an obsession with uh, outcome, results. Let's measure. Yeah. Let's measure performance. How are we going to measure performance? Results, mm. outcome. Mm. That drives behavior. Mm. And I've seen firsthand very uh, reasonable, rational, really great people turn into raving lunatics mm. on, the side of a, on the side of a pitch of some kind because – they've lost sight of what's important Mm. and they've lost sight of the fact that like you just said there you know a great quote you know which is you know sports about a hell of a lot more than just this economic side of things so if you take Mm. economics to be you know the idea of uh you know almost like that competition of winner and loser in in business you know i've i've got the deal done and that has infected our landscape just look anytime you see a discussion and I know Twitter is not the best forum for this kind of debate but anytime you see an organization trying to change that dynamic slightly so let's say move away from the focus on results let's talk about uh, let's focus on you know other things other than results the experience of the performer let's talk about having an amazing time of being engaged by sport and developing all of the um, you know brilliant kind of you know well-being and all those sorts of things uh, and they and, and people go absolutely crazy. They go, no, what the hell are you talking about? You know, life is competitive. So you mm. must learn, learn in sport to be competitive. Like sport's the only place you can learn to be competitive, by the way. Yeah. You know, you've got to learn to be competitive. Otherwise, you're not going to derive one of the premium benefits out of sport and then you won't be competitive in the rest of your life. And I just, honestly, it's like, and it, but if the super doggy dog competitive world didn't exist, we wouldn't even mm. be thinking about sport in this way. It would be a genuine form of recreation. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting one, too. I think around the difference between 
because you could argue also that sport is inherently competitive, like it's one of the key yeah. elements yeah. that makes sport is competition. Yeah. I think it's then the distinction winning is not the same thing. So the result, the winner and the loser is not the same thing as competition. Yeah. And and that's where I think that's where we've, yeah, just lost lost our way um you know and, and in broader society as well if it's this binary and doesn't it fit so well with this kind of polarized yeah. world we're now in because sport's great for that i know you can have a draw in some sports obviously but you've got the winner and the loser you know so two you know great teams might you know i'm talking now obviously even at a professional level might battle it out for a hundred odd minutes you know there's great moments great plays from everyone but all it boils down to is nuts one team's bloody fantastic, the other you loses. You know, the, there was it's just binary. And, you know, that just doesn't really, doesn't do it justice, I think, for what, what sport could offer. You know, and that's, and I, and, I, and I deliberately use a professional sport context. So if we're saying that's the case at a professional level even, what about for your under eights <laughs> on the weekend where the same dynamic exists? That now nah, one nil, so you lot of champions, you lot of bunch of losers, which yeah, may not get explicitly said. But the behaviour of adults, one, and we were talking before we came on air, Stu, about my little bloke and what he's picked up at four and five years of age. Yeah, they're they're perceiving it if you want to use those terms. Yeah, and it's shaping them. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, and you're absolutely right. By the way, we should distinguish um, winning outcome of game. And competing yeah you know you, you can and this is the point people say oh well when, we, when we've taken away or we de-emphasize the outcome winning mm. we mm. de-emphasize that people equate that as being your uncompetitive no mm. you can have a brilliantly competitive game without being yeah. focused on the winning yeah you know well, it's almost actually, like yeah. go on if you focus too much on the winning competition drops so what's That's interesting right. you, again use profession particularly a professional sport you often hear are oh, when it got to four nil, I knew the result was gone. So we kind of half just went through the motions. So actually, what you're saying is you weren't competing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So when you get too caught up in results, actually, yeah, that could could decrease your competitiveness. If you're competitive, then every moment is an opportunity to compete, in a, and not necessarily against someone else. It's yourself. And you know, we know we've heard lots of stories, haven't we? Probably best athletes and teams there they're competing against themselves and you know we talk about an all blacks example of actually they're collaborating with the other team to help them themselves get better so you know we can't be our best until you you're your best so we want you to get better as another team because that will force us to get better because we're really competing with ourselves to see how good we can be yeah which is the, the the true you know the kind of true definition of competition isn't it yeah, and you could, you know, you could link some of that to more of that mastery orientation, I suppose, and some of the motivational theories that that link to that as well, potentially. Mm. But you know, yeah. I, I, I'm um, I, I'm fascinated by this because I mean, I I know in my childhood, the best games, the most competitive games, were where you went, where you went, what's the score? Yeah, because <laughs> you've lost, you've just completely lost sight of it because you're so yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that, that's a, and that's the thing, isn't it? That particularly, I think, um, you know, my time in professional sports, when when teams are starting to struggle because the result is, you know, it does matter. It obviously does does yeah. matter, but because that consumes teams, they can't then stay in the moment, like you're just describing. They can't just stay in the moment of just that, fully immersed in this, you know, competing, striving, and. You know, and almost the, I think the the joy and enjoyment that that should come from that. I totally agree. I had, an, I had a personal experience of it not long ago, where my under tens team were playing in a in a county tournament. It's the it's the only proper tournament, I suppose, that they play in. Otherwise, it's usually a festival where everybody plays the same number of games. Obviously, there's a score and all that sort of stuff, but it's not like there's a semi final and a final. This was the semi-final and the final. And mm. they had played beautifully. They mm. really had just, you know, literally just playing amazing stuff. It's like, it's all, you know, feel like it's all coming together and all that sort of stuff after working with them for four or five years. And um, 
we got to the semi-final and it changed mm. the adults on the side and i'll include myself in this <laughs> our behavior did change it might yeah. it might not have been enormous i mean for some adults it become it became very different but you know even for me i was just subtle differences in terms yeah. of tone and body language and all these sorts of things that it's very hard to kind of pick yourself up from and I watched them play, and it was the same for them as well. They weren't able to do the things they were doing before. They started doing mm. different things, and it's because they'd almost become too aware yeah. of the outcome and what what was riding on it. And yeah. um, you know, it's uh, this is one of the reasons why you know, up until a certain age point, I feel like you're they're not able to truly play and truly derive all the great benefits of childhood sport because we throw results and outcomes at them far too early. I mean, this idea of mm. leagues for seven-year-olds, just, mm. you know, it's like it, all that does is heighten or place greater emphasis on outcome. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, I think that from, from my experiences and, again, from what I've seen my lad go through as well you know if if learnings like particularly motor learning early on is largely about exploring exploration you know use a theoretical term exploring the perceptual motor landscape is i've got anecdotes from him that clearly have closed down his exploration because he either perceives or correctly or incorrectly that the result is the most important thing so you know we won't try you know, using a, a particularly skillful move out of the back because we might concede a goal, which is why I've, I've asked him, well, why don't you try that turn or whatever? Or, you know, passing the ball. Oh, well, we might lose it and, and the te- other team will score. Yeah. And, or, and we'll, you know, we'll lose the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, all these, all these things, if that, if, that conti- if that starts at that early age, that, you know, that has shut down there for their exploration. So, you know, a lot of things we know suggest that is a limiter then to learning. And then ultimately for, you know, those that may go on, going to be a limiter ultimately to performance if performance does matter more at some point for, for some people who participate in sport. Something, um, you, something you've just said, said there is, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, childhood sport and learning in sport is about exploration what Mm. are you talking about no it's not it's about being taught specific techniques so that you can perform as an elite professional in 20 years time isn't it (laughs) now you're going fishing (laughs) Stu. and if if twitter's not a forum for that discussion which it definitely isn't after (laughs) actually being more of an observer actually in recent years but over seven or eight years of seeing that technique debate go on, it's definitely not the forum. I'm not sure this is the forum either between us. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what is to be honest. Um, but again, I think it's important that you get different views. Yeah. My, 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 um, my fishing isn't as um, subtle as yours. It's a bit more of a <laughs> sledgehammer type fishing. No, um, I mean, you know, we, I mean, that, that's an interesting one though. Stu. I mean, that gets, that's going to be brought up if I, if I had, as much as we, it's hard to predict the future, uh, if I did have to try and make predictions, if I'm going to do a skill acquisition session, what I'm prepared to almost, you know, bet the house on is this debate around isolated technical technique training will come up, <laughs> which, which is good, you know, which is right, just really interesting every time you go through it now to get the, the varying views. I think what, what's interesting when you really unpack what people are talking about with technique and you know, and, and people who I think, you know, have, have got some real wisdom and, and know what they're talking about, you know, they shouldn't be dismissed, is they most often still reference something about a context. So the technique is still relative to an opponent or positioning of teammates. So whilst they're using the word technique, what their, their actual, whether they're only tacitly aware of it or explicitly, is is not something out of context it's actually something in context which i've just found interesting is a bit of a theme um Uh, okay interesting Um, as as from from people that you know i i you know think have got some really good experience and wisdom uh, yeah so what what you're so what you're saying there is that um even though so often when 
people are challenging a narrative which suggests that isolation as a means to develop uh, skill, i.e., you know, the ability to perform a movement in a context based mm. on those contextual perceptual variables. Mm. Um, so the methodology to achieve that, people are often mm. they're often using those examples as the reference point and not mm. quite knitting the two things together. Is that fair? Yeah, some yeah, yeah, sometimes. I think there's there's still that's yeah, still doesn't then get around right, how is then the best way to develop, even if you want to keep using the word the technique, should we develop it in the game, i.e. with some of those contextual perceptual variables or through a game-like activity or do we do it in isolation? So it doesn't get around that, but it opens up a discussion and, you know, again, you can normally get to some type of continuum type thing and maybe what are a few of the, again, principles or rules of thumb that we may look at for why we might sit along various places on that continuum. So what we did, like you say, definitely don't want to go down that, that rabbit hole necessarily, but I am interested in, 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 within the context of what we've been talking around, around kind of like socio-cultural organizational constraints Mm. and, you know, the way business works and the influences. I do, I do want to talk about reductionism. Um, mm-hmm. cause I know it's, I know it's one of my fastest miles principles as well about rejecting redu- redu- reductionism. And mm-hmm. so for me, I see this everywhere. So, and, and part of the reason I think reductionism occurs is again, through environmental constraints. So for example, if you're in an environment where outcome winning is really important, why is it important? Economically, it's important in some contexts, uh, it's, it's it's dependent on the survival of the organization now in a children's context this can be very true as well because you know more people come if if people are winning more people come you know you can think about this in schools context and this that and the other it's almost like a marketing it's the biggest marketing thing if you can put down that your league winners and this that and the other you know you get more people in more bums on seats equals there's a revenue stream sometimes people's livelihoods depend on this understand mm-hmm. the economics of that but what, we, what that then does is, and what people don't realize is that that then translates right down and, and conflicts immediately with a, a, an exploratory uh, context around learning. Because immediately, mm. if results are important, we talk about forms of life. If that's mm. your form of life as a practitioner, and you've got this environmental pressure from your employer saying these results are important, it's not... Mm overly uh, overly surprising is it that those individuals start to use reductionist methodologies as a Mm. means to get the quick fix necessary to bring about their their organizational organization and therefore their survival Mm. so i'm just Mm. interested in the influences those influences those environmental influences leading Mm. people to reductionist approaches Mm. and i think that's something that i come up against come up against a lot yeah and i think the connection there Stu, in that what you've just talked through is is i I think around the kind of the the metric or need to quantify so that's a lot of where the not a lot but related to this reductionism is often if we if we think we have to quantify something it's often, yeah, and it's becoming less the case with better measurement devices and more sophisticated technology. But certainly in the past, we've had to reduce it into a part and that makes it so-called measurable, yep. i.e. quantifiable or objective, which is what organisations love to talk about, our smart objectives and all that garbage. <laughs> you know, so I think that, that then leads, as you say, to then, right, okay, we can hit our smart objective because we can provide some metric or quantification that we've done something but yeah have we reduced it so much by doing that that actually the whole hasn't changed or what the reality is that we actually don't know if the whole has changed and what we're really interested in the organizations is more the whole or or a larger scale they're not actually interested in that little thing Mm -hmm. it's more has has changing this tweaking this shifting it nudging it what impact has that had on the bigger thing? Mm. You know, and that could be a single athlete. So if we, if we, you know, if they improve their um, beep test, does that make them a better hockey player? So we're not actually interested in the beep test. We're interested in does it make them a better player on a hockey pitch in a hockey match? 
same, same thing in organization. We're not, we're not interested necessarily in um, how many workshops get delivered to coaches or how many number of coaches who get accredited. We're interested in probably the quality of coaching or from the, from the players or learners perspective, the quality of environment. Mm. And, and again, back to that often is we actually don't know. <laughs> mm. So, you know, it's that interesting space then around, well, can we better measure the whole or kind of the bigger picture, but possibly if, if we keep equating measurement with quantifying things or and a bit back to kind of narratives, can we probably put more weight in qualitative approaches um, as well that, that give us a better handle on what's going on and create better learning or feedback loops so that we can better iterate, if you like, constantly you know, rather than think we've got the, we know what we need to do, we've planned it, we've set the smart objectives, we know how to measure it, we deliver it and we hit our targets and everything's great. Oh, but actually what we subjectively see and feel and hear doesn't look great. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's just trying to, yeah, if I navigate a way to, again, not to, to the both end, not to throw out quantity, trying to quantify things or measurement. It's definitely not that. It's just probably in a, a different framework um, to try and incorporate some of that but also look at other ways of, of seeing and understanding. It, it, I think for a lot of people it feels, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this, it feels counterintuitive. So it's, I think it's quite natural, not natural, I think people feel it's natural that if you have your smart objective, I, lo I love that, by the way. And all that garbage. I like that phrase. Um, if you have your smart objectives and um, you, uh, uh, it means that you then, it leads you to methodologies that directly deliver against those smart objectives. Mm -hmm. But they might not be the right things. And that can be at the expense of creativity, mm -hmm. you know, people innovation all those sorts yeah. of things um yeah. because under pressure people want to achieve those sorts of things in yeah. my in my experience i've the problem i think a lot of organizations feel and it from, goes from the team level up to the you know major business level is that adopting an approach that i would which is which is right let's create a brilliant environment where our people can thrive and they can do amazing things and they'll help our business grow, which will mm. then achieve our bottom line. We still got to be clear about what we're trying to achieve. We still got to be clear about our objectives and all those sorts of things. But instead of mm. saying, and, and what we're going to do now is work backwards to say, this is how you're going to do it. Mm. Instead of saying that and creating a whole load of rules and procedures and everything else. If you went around the route and say, right, we're going to create a brilliant environment for you where you're, you're really valued uh, you feel psychologically safe as well as, you know, physically safe. You're, you're, you're led really well by people who really, really want to help you achieve. Give the best. You're given the best opportunity to learn and develop both from your experiences and from other sources of information. So that you can be a so real investment in people, <clears throat> an investment environment. If you, if they did that, they'd get the outcomes. But it, it feels like that's too loose. It's not controlled. Mm. Oh, all sorts of things could happen. Oh my God, mm -hmm. you know, oh, we're not, you know, and so the fear, it's very fearful because it feels like a real leap of faith. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that probably um, hits to, to maybe, I think one of the core things or the, the core element of this um, is people's ability to embrace uncertainty. Mm. And, and again, you know, this is... I would say put this in philosophical because, you know, there's probably bits of what you might call some evidence or literature out there. But, you know, I, I think it, and, and it, I think it's a, often around a stage of life or different life experiences that, you know, particularly leaders, their ability to embrace uncertainty rather than fear it. And, and as you say, when the fear comes in, the reaction is to control, to and often it's creating an illusion of control, but try to over control. So I think this, the, the core theme of all of this and, and what we haven't probably mentioned, I guess, is, you know, grounding this in saying if we're, these are complex systems, complex social systems, they're not engineered mechanistic systems. So uncertainty is inherent 
in this, you know, whether it's, again, what's going to happen in this session tonight, Stu, that you're going to take um, out on the hockey pitch through to, you know, what's going to happen in at the next Olympics and are we going to hit our medal targets if we're UK sport or, you know, there's, there's just that uncertainty. And I think for me, the best leaders and formal leaders find a way to not, not necessarily embrace it and love it, but they're able to tolerate, navigate and, and, and keep cultivate and, and create those environments you just talked about where those feelings of, you know, say all those things are there rather than intrude on them. Because as soon as you start to feel like I need to control, I think that's where some a lot of those things, really good things you just mentioned, start to get threatened or closed down. Yeah. Yeah, I actually I was just you just made me think. I was just looking at some of the things that you guys at My Fastest Mile talk about in terms of what you believe. And um, you know, you say you believe that the future is emergent and uncertain. Um and mm-hmm. so you try and stay nimble and manage in the moment and resist the urge to predict the future and attempt to manage it with long-term strategy plans. We believe people are not machines. Mm-hmm. And your point about mechanistic and reductionist approaches is kind of my point because I think this infects our coaching context as well because I do genuinely believe, and actually we've just produced a series of kind of uh, like little, little cartoon funnies about you know various ways in which coaches act that will go out in uh, as part of – uh, coaching week over here and um, in two weeks time um, and uh, one of the things we've done on that is talk about you know how if they could genuinely there's a lot of coaches that genuinely think they would they would have a joystick controller and they would try and mm-hmm. control they would love for people and so they're using methodologies to try and make players more like machines mm-hmm. in order to bring about the result they're looking for as opposed to saying we want you to be absolutely nothing like machines we want you to be mm. brilliant problem solvers because then you'll be absolutely unbeatable. Mm. If that's your outcome, by the way, you know, if that's your focus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. No. And I, th- I was having a good discussion with a coach last week, actually about um, probably how this relates to certainty and control as it relates to a, a single session design or plan. And we're talking about, should we adapt, should he adapt or flex the session as well as, this idea of a curriculum across the season. And, and again, it's the both end, like where's the right balance um, for it? And I think what he was describing, I thought was quite good as in he said, you know, I'll often start with a session plan and we'll get into something, but quite often we'll go a lot longer with something. If I think I'm seeing certain, you know, cues or, or things going on that, that say actually we need to, to stick with this game for, for another 10 or 15 minutes and we can get, you know, a lot more learning or actually we've gone off on a tangent and there's a real opportunity here by staying in the moment to, to see that opportunity, perceive that as the coach and really take advantage of it. Wow, there's a learning moment here that might not have been on my session plan or session objectives, but there's an affordance to use the A word. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and it was a similar thing around the curriculum too across the season. So we've got to have some idea of maybe, you know, what are the key skills, tactical concepts that we're trying to broadly work on? But equally, should we be mapping out and using a reduction of approach under technical, tactical, physical, mental, and have each of those mapped out for each week for 26 weeks? You know, that's, again, the illusion of, wow, isn't that great? How planned and the detail, and this is fantastic. We haven't got a bloody clue where a young player is going to be in 26 weeks' time. You can't tell me that they need to do low block defending. You know that they need to do low block defending in week 26 when it's week one now, if they're an under 12 or 14 player. So, um, yeah, again, it's just, you know, again, what, you know, how much certainty is there? How much do we want to control it there for? How much planning and ultimately then kind of linear type approaches do, do we take? And, and, yeah, they're just they're just interesting discussions. I, I think it's it's fascinating, isn't it? Because the li, li, this linearity is everywhere, and it's all it, it's. It, I, I, again, I think it's, it's it might not necessarily by, be the coach's need for certainty. It might be the coach's need to provide their employer or superior or parents who are stakeholders, mm-hmm. any stakeholder, with certainty mm-hmm. or yeah. perceived certainty. Because then, it yeah. like you know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. And exactly. And, that, and that's, again, the interesting thing, I think, for, for some of the coaches who really want to explore 
you know, more of um, the non, a non-linear approach, if you want to put it that way. Sometimes it is the grassroots coach who no one really cares what they're up to in a way. <laughs> they've got more freedom to play around and explore. And, you know, pair, often parents are still, they're still in that dynamic. Um, but I think, well, I'm hearing more and more good stories, I think, about coaches being really open now to we need to work with parents and, you know, again, engage them in dialogue. Um, the earlier we do that, the better. So it's interesting that often they've got some more freedom to do that, whereas the ones that are in the more bigger clubs or more structured organisations, you know, yeah, they hit up against against those things. Um, and, and it can be a frustrating place. I know there's a couple of coaches um, I'm working with who are kind of getting quite frustrated and it's got to that point of, you know, do I look elsewhere for an opportunity because I, I need to for that opportunity to, to grow and develop, which is reality, but it's also, you know, a bit disappointing really as well at the same time. I was on a, I was on a conference last week with, um, last weekend and I had a great, a great talk by Ollie Logan uh, mm-hmm. talking about yeah, this, really. this approach in the, in the swimming context. And he used, he referenced something that I'd kind of forgotten about, which was the idea of an exploratorium. And and that's one of the reasons I love coaching young children. And I'm, it's funny mm-hmm. enough, as I move up the age groups, like, so for example, I've been doing under nines cricket for the last, they do under tens hockey, under nines cricket. I've been doing under nines cricket for the last couple of years and it's great. It's pure exploratory and we haven't got any competitive matches, anything like that. We just play games and come up with it. And I genuinely describe it as it's, it's me exploring with them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I'm like, I come away from it. There's times, no doubt, right? You know, there's a lot of kids there. There's times I come away and I'm like, wow, that was difficult. That, you know, that didn't quite go according to plan. We didn't yeah. have the number of coaches we needed. You know, the, set, the, the ideas I had around activities didn't quite work as planned. We had to adapt on mm. the fly. It was really challenging. Um, but they're great because that's really exploratory and I'm picking up lots of different ideas and thoughts. But mm. as I move up the age groups, so I've now we've moved up an age group to under 11 and now they start playing competitively and they're playing, you know, mm-hmm. then, you know, I'm like, I'm trying to stay, uh, I, I'm, well, I'm deliberately, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to move away from this and I'm going to keep the exploratory idea there um, and keep working with them in that way, partially just because it's, it's kind of the way that I derive most enjoyment from the experience myself. So selfishly, there's an argument that I'm just doing it that way. But, um, I can feel just just subtly I can feel because there's now more outcome focus a little driver towards well we need to do this because otherwise they won't be able to do that in the game and I'm like well that's okay so I'm constantly having to say to some of the parents and some of the other coaches I'm working with like our job here is to let them explore different game problems and then that'll create something that they can't quite work out which they can come and work with us on if they want or they can go away and go into the back garden, the best learning space in the world, and 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 do some do something with brother, mm. sister, father, mother, whoever it is, and mm. then come back next week and say, I, I did this. What do you think of this idea around my solving the problem that I came up against? Early mm. days, but just trying to get it into that space a little bit. Yeah, it's an interesting one, Sheryl. Yeah, I just started talking about that. I wonder what your experiences are around that if you had to generalise, do you see, is there a tipping point of age at the moment where some of these, you know, where players stop being as exploratory or open to novel and new situations and some of that starts to close down? Have you, do you have a, do you think there's a certain age where some of that starts to sharply decline from your experience? Yeah, I do. Um, I think, it, and it's happening earlier and earlier. It's happening earlier mm. than it should. Mm. Um, if I had my choice, we wouldn't be playing like league and competitive matches. We we would just play a list of friendlies, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of just just games to play against other teams, so that we can just come together and play. Um, uh, if that's what if I had my choice, um, I think the format would be different as well. So I think. It's, I think it seems to intersect with the point in which formal competition starts to, starts to come into play. I think that's okay. where the influencer, that's why I was talking about this, I think, because that for me is, in my experience, mm. the influencer of the change of behaviour in both yeah. performer and coach. Yeah, yeah, def- yeah, interesting. Because, yeah, we, 
one, one of the things you hear from coaches, I guess, particularly once they get to the professional kind of adult level is, and, you know, I think there's a fair point is sometimes by that point that, you know, it's then too late to then sometimes open players back up if they've, and particularly if they've then got certain, you know, skill or let's say adaptive behaviour deficiencies where they're quite rigid to, to get them sometimes to open up to being very exploratory mm. um, and being up for, again, using kind of theoretical terms, they're throwing a lot of noise at them and a lot of variability. Mm. Yeah, it's really, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to do. Um, by that stage, so I think that you know that's that's the challenge. I can, you know, I remember reading an article on uh, Roger Federer, and for me, he's someone who stays and has stayed and is still exploratory. Um, mm. An article last year about his comeback and just describing how he's working on his backhand, and you know, there's things there that yeah, he's just exploring the dynamics of the game still. Mm. <laughs> how he and his racket and the ball and the court all interact and what <laughs> what he can what he can do with all of that. Um, which yeah, again I think that's that's a bit of a, a trade of the best, but it's back to that kind of he's competing against himself. Yeah. Um, but another way of putting it is he's still exploring the dynamics of the game. Yeah. Even at how how old is he now? Thirty six or something. And when you see him play, it's so it's so joyful to watch because you can almost see that exploratory joy coming to life in the, I genuinely believe when he's playing, he does things that he doesn't know he can do. Mm. Mm. I, I just, he, he must, I, he must do because mm. there's no way anyone's taught. He just, he does things that no one would say that you should, you should do. No one would teach him to do. And he does them and he does them like they're effortless and natural. Mm-hmm. And sometimes mm-hmm. I think he genuinely derives the greatest joy from those moments when he does things and he surprises himself. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, again, we're making some assumptions, aren't we? But where some of why maybe he maintains his motivation is because he still is exploring the game. You know, he hasn't solved it. Oh, actually, yeah, that's interesting. But he's also a good case for, you know, as a younger player in his, in his teens and even into early 20s was someone who was quite volatile, if you say, str- struggled a bit to contain himself emotionally. And you, mm. it's hard to imagine that now when you see him like he is now. But another good case of kind of, you know, the idea of, I guess, that, that nonlinear journey. And at times there were more challenging points, um, you know, that he, he had to work through and probably took him, you know, an, a number of years um, to work through some of those. So, you know, it's... it's bit to that kind of rocky road idea it's not a smooth ascent even for someone who ultimately probably ends up being you know the greatest tennis player of all time arguably i I take uh i'm constantly on the lookout for evidence that i'm i'm not overly constraining the players uh or when i say overly constraining over constraining and under constraining i think is a major issue but um so for example i i look for a look for evidence that i haven't kind of dropped into reductionist methodology um and also sometimes i'm also trying to challenge myself because i've got huge confirmation bias around you know looking for ex- a- a- examples of oh look my methodology is working because look what's yeah. happening over here yeah actually yeah. funnily enough um my evidence usually stems from some of the ways in which the individuals you know get things what you might call classically wrong but they're not wrong in their in their context. So because we haven't focused on let's take the cricketing idea again, because we haven't focused on technique, what we've focused in is focused on is here's the game interactions for you to go and explore within. We played a game the other day, cricketing game. Most of the kids uh now if, if they'd been in been in a different environment, they'd have all had all the shots because they'd have been taught the shots. So my kids haven't been taught the shots. Mm. They've been given exposure to games and many of them many of them have only had an hour a week of cricket if that you know they get an hour a week with me in the summer and there's others who've got older brother or whatever or father who's a cricketer who've clearly had more backyard exposure and therefore they have more um tools technical tools i suppose you could describe them as Mm -hmm. But when the ones that haven't had that, the ones who've been with me just playing games and just trying to find a way of getting the ball somewhere when they're batting, mm. I'm talking about a batting context mm. mostly. Those ones are interesting because when we create this game the other day where they can't, most of them struggle to hit the ball on the offside. 
because it's kind of natural move to on the leg side, kind of on the offside. Um, anybody who doesn't know what the offside is, it's kind of, oh, it's if you're, st- I can't even describe it. I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> Google, it. Google it. Yeah, no, Google it. Um, um, so what we did was we played a game where you get 10 points if you can hit the ball into the blue sector, which is on the offside. Yeah. Um, and you're only getting normal points if you hit it over the other area. So it's a big bonus yeah. to be had over there. Yeah. And when you see a child do what is essentially a reverse sweep or reverse pull to mm. get the ball there, Mm. Now, that, then I'm starting to, and not always, uh, definitely, you know, getting out and not getting right mm. and all these sorts of things, but that's their solution. They yeah. haven't got another one they've been taught. They haven't been taught to drive or cut or whatever. Mm. It's just, mm. here's, and they've gone, well, that seems to make sense to me. Yeah. And they have a go at it. For me, that's where I start to go. They're the little aha moments where mm. I think that's really a moment where somebody is genuinely in exploration mode. Mm. yeah yeah absolutely and, and the interesting one with you talk about over constraining or using constraints sometimes you you do need to over constrain to get players exploring again so if they've converged to a very narrow solution so particularly the problem becomes you know if they develop a certain skill or probably more likely in kids are physically dominant they learn to solve a problem on the pitch in just one way and we know that that's ultimately actually going to be a limiter yeah so actually we have to constrain potentially if we want to get them to explore other options we have to find a way almost to take that away from them yeah. you know you can i do that explicitly like there's lots of ways isn't there Stu? you can do that by saying well you're not allowed to do that through to other clever ways of manipulating the game for them that almost forces them to explore so it's an interesting one is in it's it's force almost forcing someone but forcing them to an exploratory space rather than forcing them into a very narrow prescriptive space. Absolutely. So yeah, that's that's an interesting dynamic. And I think it's it, again similar to try and connect these principles at different levels. It's similar in coaching. One of the I think quite often effective ways, what you want to take away from coaches if if you want them to explore and grow is take away their technical knowledge. So what constraint do we apply? get them to coach a sport that they're not technically familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Don't have it then, do you? No. And so you can't fall back on your technical knowledge. Suddenly, you know, that's been taken away or I've got to, you know, and if you kind of have to persist in it long enough and you stay engaged and motivated, you kind of have to find out maybe what else actually you are quite good at that applies across all coaching contexts, not just your own sport or start to, search and discover you know other other elements i.e around well what are principles of play maybe they stand up or some of the pedagogy and skill acquisition principles you know maybe they still apply um some of the relationship you know obviously key coach athlete relationship dynamics so um yeah i think it's an interesting one of how you constrain i know you've talked about constrain to afford or constrain to explore can you unpack constraint to afford a little bit for people? I, um, I'd be interested just to get kind of how you, how you articulate that. Um, because I think I've got my own conception of what I think constraint to afford means, but I'd be interested in what, what, how you, how you kind of um, describe it. Yeah. I heard, oh, I heard you mention it briefly. I think it was with Ed and Sean, wasn't it? When you were debriefing cork and apparently that's all you need to call it is just cork and everyone knows yeah. what that, yeah. Oh, remember cork. Oh, yeah. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I know you referenced that, and I think in relation to Danny Newcomb's talked about that, hasn't he? That, yeah. That's a bit strange before it. It's an interesting. I yeah. I mean, it it does does all fit together. I guess it depends how <laughs> how deep and how long you you kind of want to go into to some of this, too, because you know, what, what are affordances really, you know, opportunities for action in the, in the environment, but they're obviously, you know, re- related to, so I guess constraining, you could be constraining the person or the environment in this case. So let, let's take a, an example of actually, if I constrain a person by saying they're not allowed to use their preferred foot to pass the ball, say right foot, that that has probably changed, and we know that they're weaker on their left foot. That's probably changed the affordances that that are available to them in the environment, or has just changed the affordances. Mm-hmm. 
so you can constrain the person but obviously equally and probably more often you constrain the environment or more specifically you know the task so if we're looking to to play forward you know if i have a maybe lower uh, density of defensive players there'll be more affordances opportunities to play forward and pass the ball forward or penetrate up the pitch if we have maybe a higher density of defensive players ahead of the ball probably reduces those penetrating affordances if you like so yeah i think you know there's a number of ways you can constrain to afford um i think the the, the important thing about constrain to afford is i think when when people hear about the constraints led approach or constraints led coaching or methodology they uh they immediately assume i actually think because of the nature of constraint they they think of reduce uh and hence one of the one of the constraints people often talk about is for example to touch mm-hmm. you know and if you think about it from the perspective i mean i've often wondered whether we should use affordance led and, and i know the a word again but maybe mm-hmm. it should be affordance led because mm-hmm. constraint says you can't you know you're almost like you can't do these sorts of things that now that's assuming yeah. it's a task constraint but if it's an environmental constraint it may still have more opportunities for action but mm. the thing for me that's interesting about that is um you still need to be clear about kind of what your intent is as a coach this intentionality mm. piece and i think that's the bit that's often missing so i think quite often I, a lot of what i'm seeing is people are kind of throwing constraints in either because they've seen them from somewhere else or mm. they think, Oh, this might be an interesting variable to do or, Oh yeah, we are going to work on passing. So if we limit the amount of touches people can have, they have to pass. That seems mm. very obvious. It seems like a very obvious way of constraining to afford. Yeah. What it then does though is, is it reduces various opportunities for action. So mm. for example, the, the landscape might afford you to run, with the ball that might be the thing to do and if you haven't got the decision to make then you take away too many decisions so it's about constantly playing with and not taking away too many opportunities for action now it's perfectly acceptable i think sometimes to take away certain opportunities for action because if you're Mm. very very focused on a particular thing you want to give them maximum opportunity to explore that totally get that But I don't think people quite realize that sometimes, that if they constrain in certain ways, they lose too much from the affordance landscape, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, it becomes prescriptive, doesn't it, really, is what almost what you're saying is ultimately if you take away all, you know, some of that that language, um, you're pretty much what we'd say just prescribing or or directing or instructing, here's what I want you to do. Um, and And, you know, that is, yeah often not not the most productive way to go about it so as you say it's the landscape affordances or just keeping those range of opportunities or actions available to players but it's and and again this is you know as would be pointed out by a number of people some of these ideas are not new about exact how you exaggerate maybe certain so you know in tgfu and game sense approaches they talk a lot about how you shape and and exaggerate certain elements of the game or you might want to exaggerate certain affordances so again there may, there may still be, again, if we work on that principle of, um, you know, penetrating or playing forward, there may still be the ability to play with width or to dribble, but actually we might want to make it really obvious, basically. We might need to make quite obvious, you know, these opportunities to play forward. So we exaggerate them using, again, a whole range of constraints you could use, use to do that. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the principles of play, I guess we're talking team sport, and invasion sports here. I think it's the, the print, and I know you've had Ron Smith on as well, and Ron talks about this a lot. What we've seen to have lost is that understanding of the principles of play. Mm-hmm. And I think that if that's your link back to your intentionality, Stu, about yeah. like what's our intention here. You know, if I think often if you're just kind of working generally that team level rather than individually, what does this player specifically need? You know, anchoring things to the principles of play is a pretty solid starting point. Yeah, so like a, a principle of play, in, in defensive principle of play, might be say delay. So how can we how can we explore the concept of delaying the opponent? Yeah, those sorts yeah. of things. And you could play a game yeah. where there's like you could play a game very easily. I think in my head, like countdown. Yeah, where yeah, they've, exactly. just, they've just got to get the ball to a certain place in a time limit, and all you've got to do is stop them getting there in that time limit, and then you've got to gain yeah. lots of delay. 
Yeah, exactly. So, so in a way, you've maybe taken away some of the, the emphasis on actually winning, if we're turned defensively, winning the ball back. Mm-hmm. But it, it explores, yeah, would, I think that would naturally encourage players and individually and collectively to explore different ways to delay, which might be all to just drop back and kind of park the bus. Yeah. Or they might actually find, no, that makes it easy. They can now go over us too easily or something. So actually we need to find, you know, a combination of some players maybe back, but we need to, yeah, pressure the, have someone pressuring the ball carrier more, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely yeah. so. And I think keeping it at that level is quite interesting because it does allow you to be quite exploratory. It's when you get low, you start going underneath the layers and then you start talking a lot. One of the ways in which we could affect delay is to um, uh, press or mm. or close mm. down or so that's going to require us to have you know kind of superior agility so we need to work on our agility and then yeah. we immediately then bring in the S and C to work on our agility in an isolated work and then we try and bring it back into the game now why don't we work on the agility in the game that'd be really interesting wouldn't it absolutely yeah so an example I've used that we used in AFL at different times was um when we play like the small area small sided games rather than use a, a proper footy is we just use a tennis ball so the, the attacking team, it's much easier and quicker to flick a tennis ball around than it is to hand pass or kick a footy. So that overloaded the defensive team in terms of how quickly the agility aspect. So we did it because they then had to react a hell of a lot quicker because the ball could be flicked around. There's a lot more you know, acceleration, deceleration, change of direction, but it was in a contextual way. So, so we did it you know, to emphasise, I guess, a physical aspect, but still trying to do it through a game game context. Um, because we, we know that there's a big difference between what is actually called change of direction drills, which is planned, and I know I run around these cones, versus reactive agility, where there's some kind of information or stimulus in the environment that I have to respond and read and react to. That's a really good example of um, a very small change in the use of equipment bringing about quite a big change in terms of a performer, in, performer interaction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, you know, and, and I think yeah. a lot of people lose sight of. And, and the other thing that emerged from, which we didn't count on, but worked better was the attacker because they can offload the ball just with one hand. They are more prepared to take on the tackler. So you can tackle like in rugby, you can physically yeah. grab people and tackle. So the attacker had more confidence to try and evade and take on tacklers because they knew they could quickly offload with one hand. So that, again, that was more that emerged from it. We didn't necessarily think that or know that would happen in advance, but it was one of the emergent properties of those, those task constraints. Fascinating. Well, hour and 45 minutes has gone by, Mark. <laughs> We're just getting started, mate, aren't we? <laughs> We're just getting into it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, and I know it's getting late at your end um, and uh, very conscious of that. And also I'm conscious of uh, actually having some uh, a day job to get to. So um, much as I'd love to carry on and, and what I think we may, may well have done is tee up part two, um, which hopefully I won't leave for about four years. We'll try and do it sooner than that. Yeah, so you got me that time, Stu. You lured me in beautifully there. <laughs> if, if, you'd, uh, if you'd be in agreement with that. Um, yeah. I'd be, yeah, I, I'm sure it'd be brilliant to be brilliant to sort of come back on. And as you obviously spend, you know, you start to get yourself a bit more settled into Australian life and work mm. you're doing. I'm sure you're going to find some very interesting things that you might want to share with the rest of the people. In the meantime, um, how do people track you down, find out more about what you do and what you, uh, what you're all about, really? Uh, Twitter's probably a decent place. Um, Uppy01. Or uh, myfastersmile.com. Yeah, I highly recommend. Uh, I have Mark on uh, my kind of notification and uh, almost guaranteed at least three, two, three times a week, he'll throw something there that comes into my feed and I go, oh God, here we go. I've got to, this is something else I've got to learn now and I dig into and I find a new area of fascination that takes me down a rabbit hole and then I realise I've got the kids breakfast and we're running late for school. Happens pretty much every morning. So I uh, highly recommend following him as far as that's concerned. Yeah, uh, if you're up for some of that, maybe. <laughs> it definitely make you think. Definitely make you think. Uh, Mark, listen, I massively appreciate your time. I massively appreciate you, uh, you coming on, sharing some of your thoughts and experiences. Uh, I've loved the conversation um, and uh, all the best with everything that's happening in your new adventure. 
Yeah, cheers, Drew, and um, you know, really enjoying listening to your podcast as well. I think you know the the range of people that you, you're getting on, and just you know the quality of some of the discussion that that's been on there. I think is you know that I don't know. That we need to continue just to to make some connections. I, I'll just thinking out loud here a bit, particularly down in Oz. I reckon these are you know the you know the stuff that you're putting out is just coaches still aren't quite tuned in if you literally and figuratively speaking you know to some of the the opportunities so um yeah yeah keep doing what you're doing mate some really good stuff well uh conversations like this are one of the reasons i do it so uh, i fully appreciate you know uh, i mean you you sharing your information all that sort of stuff it's like the best cpd anyone could possibly have so uh just purely selfishly i can't stop now (laughs) i'm on the learning journey (laughs) absolutely mate just make sure you find out a way to measure it all right Oh, of course, yeah. I need a smart objective, of course. (laughs) All right. Anyway, I'll speak to you soon. See you, mate. See you, Stu. Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to thetalentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. Kapow. There you go. What a chat, what a conversation, fantastic. Uh, long overdue, long time coming, but hopefully you'll agree that uh, the best things come to those who wait, as they say. Um, so much knowledge in Mark Upton, he, uh, his experience and his research and the time he takes and the way he even, just even the way he thinks about the world, uh, always find it absolutely, completely uh, mesmerizing. Um, and he's uh, a very rich source of, uh, of insight for me uh, and has been uh, quite a significant influence on my, my career and, uh, and also my, my coaching um, so I uh, highly recommend checking him out and uh, finding, you know, finding out a little bit more about what he's talking about he used a phrase in that that was going to stick with me um, which is around exploring the perceptual motor landscape um, definitely something that I'm, uh, I'm trying to bring into uh, the environments that I'm creating for the uh, for the young people who I work with and uh, it's quite interesting to see what happens to them. Um, I need to say uh, a really big thank you to uh, Alexander Magelby um, who has uh, jumped on board as a Patreon supporter. Uh, you are amazing, thank you very much and uh, really appreciate your support. Uh, in the meantime everybody um, have a great week and remember ditch those drills.